Good evening, my name is Harry from 92.9 and 96.9 EHM, and it's a pleasure to be here for the next episode of Homegrown as we celebrate East End artists and musicians, and it's a chance to get to know them a little bit better. And it's uh, really, I think this is episode number six. We've, we've had a great opportunity to meet so many different people, and this is an honor tonight to welcome Nancy Atlas to the LTV studio. How are you? I'm wonderful. I'm so happy to be here. Th this is uh, really an honor because ever since I started way back yeah, at EHM, and even when I was working in radio on the East End of Long Island, your name was consistently mentioned as being, you have to see Nancy perform. She's amazing. You have to see her. She's at the talk house. She's doing this. And uh, it really is a pleasure to get to, to finally sit down and chat with you. Well, I just, I always tell people, we just don't go away. It's share the cockroaches in my band. So. Oh, please. I think you're up to 25 years. Is that right? We are. Yes, as uh, with the band, 25 yes. yeah. and almost 30 wow. as a professional musician. Now, where yeah. are you from? Now, you've been a mainstay out here in Montauk and the East End of Long Island, but where are you from originally? Uh, I grew up in Comac, um, and I, uh, my parents... We've always spent every single summer of our lives out on the East End. Wow. So when, up until I was about seven, we were still camping at Hither Hills, and then my parents bought a, a place in Lazy Point. Oh, wow. And so every single summer of my entire life, even though I grew up in Comac, has yeah. been on the East End. And then when it was time, uh, when I graduated from college, it was time to kind of choose a place to live. Um, well, I was, I was wondering because yeah. you, you you gloss over that, but if I'm not mistaken, you studied abroad for for, for I did for your studies. Yes, I did. What brought you back? And to, I, obviously, your your childhood in Montauk was a huge influence. But what made you choose to come back? Well, um, I graduated uh, college in '91. Um, I was one of those people that I grad actually graduated early. Okay. Um, and while that sounds lovely, it was because if I didn't graduate, I was going to drop out. So I either had to kind of put the gun, I, it, school, pedal the metal and get, get, get it metal. done. Yeah. I wanted out. And so, um, I, I kind of put my nose down and I graduated early, but I was over in that time at London and it was a recession. Um, there was Gulf War, there were no jobs, and I was, I had, I was uh, trained to be a graphic artist. Oh, wow. uh, and also I thought I was going to be a, prof a painter um, and go that route. But I picked up, there were no jobs. I kept getting rejected at all of the, um, the studios that were in London. I was going to yeah. stay in London. And um, the advertising places. And so I, I went and I was completely depressed. And it was... Well, you had played and uh, had you performed... When did you first learn guitar? How old were you when you first... I was, well, I was... It was that, that I was graduating was from just college. college. I was 21. Had you sung before? Had you... like What had you done yes. musically? Okay. All yes. Right, was... No, no. I If I look back on my life, uh, I can tell you that I was born a songwriter. Um, my first recollection of music is at three, wow. earing out music on it. We had this old upright. Um, and I can think back now, like in seventh grade, Debbie Gibson was the big <laughs> thing. I don't know if you even know, if you youngins even know who Debbie Gibson is, but she was this. And so for seventh grade and eighth grade, my talent show, I piano was my okay. instrument at the time. Wow. I would perform. And all through my high school career, people knew me for original songs yeah. so i would i think shades of blue was my seventh grade talent show and it's, i'm sure there's some footage out there <laughs> somewhere we're not looking for that to be dug up but you know so what happened for me is i was um also very into to the arts and i was kind of studying at a college level by 10th grade for art for fine art yeah. and i thought that was going to be kind of what my life went, where my life went. But um, I literally bought a guitar. It was a day like today. It was raining out. And the guitar, I had 60 quid, which is pounds, so, yeah. so like 100 bucks. Wow. And I went down to Portobello Road, and I saw this guitar. It had no case, and it was pissing cats and dogs out. The guy gave me a plastic bag. Wow. And I'll tell you, like, I... I think it was I had I, I got a Van Morrison tablature book, and I think within a week I was playing at wow. uh, at parties. So you had never played the guitar. Before. I had never played guitar, That's but crazy. I had I had. But you could read music. And I you could read music. Yeah. I played viola for ten years oh, okay. as well. So I had classical training. I was I've had musical training, and so for me, I think I was in about two or three weeks of learning guitar before I and I immediately was writing. Wow. And and then. 
then came this kind of epiphany where I just think any artist or any person has that moment where they say, I could die for this. And and the big joke my parents said is, couldn't you have figured that out before you went to art college for three years? But I, I immediately thought I could die for this. Uh, I don't care about all of the other things. I This is... So um, I came home and I... Um, I immediately went to all of the open mics at the talk house and everywhere and anywhere. And I cut my teeth constantly, constantly playing anywhere that would have me. So this was really, that was the decision was made. This is, this is the career I'm choosing and I'm going for it. I just never looked back. Uh I, I kind of had this and I still have this feeling that, you know, you can say whatever you want about my, my voice. Uh, You can critique what I wear uh, you can tell me, but please, I could care less about your your view on my songs. Like, I hope you get something yeah. from them, but that is, it's very, it sounds very harsh coming out, but that is my... That's who you are. That's my therapy, yeah. okay? And so I spend an enormous amount of time writing my songs. It is my passion, and it is my chess game with myself. I think the same way that an actor would dissect... Um, maybe a passage or something like I get off on writing and 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 the craft of it. Had so you, when you were growing up, were you writing poetry or so, were you writing songs without knowing it in a way? Or well, I was writing from a very early age on yeah. piano, and then I just kind of stopped. I thought I might go into acting. I thought I might have all of these different things. Well, what I find interesting is you have a background in graphic design. You have a, a an arts. And it's interesting to see, as I've kind of done my research, so to speak, how it's all lined up and kind of led to a lot of the stuff you're doing now. But over the years, how those talents have really made you who you are today. Um, it's interesting to see because it's you really you're obviously an amazing performer, but you're also very impressive on the business side because you've built this you. whole career, but not just for yourself, but for other people too, with the band and also the East End of Long Island. And I kind of want to dive into that a, a little bit. When did you start? You So you came back after college and were you living out in Montauk or in the East End? Or? Yeah. A little sidebar of that is that from 14 on, I was working at the Clam Bar at Nepeague, which a lot of people would be familiar with across from lunch. I mean, the yeah. Clam Bar is the Clam Bar now. You don't even have to say that. Um, but I worked there for 10 years and I managed, I managed wow. the restaurant from 19 to 25. Um, and that really was a huge turning point for me because I had a very nice life. I would work for, um, by the time I was, you know, I got out of college, I would work probably seven or eight months and then I would yeah. travel for four or five. So, right. it, you know, and, and, and the owner at the time, Dick Earl, like he had offered me to go and start up restaurants with him and, kind of take on this and I had to turn to him and I had to say no I I have to give this a shot and it I can't just be playing on the side and I have to play on weekends and so I said could I just waitress here and at the time I had been running the place for five or six years and he said no you can't you can't you've been my manager and and when you were manager there, you're really running the entire ship. But that, you're asking about the business side of it, and I appreciate you understanding that because um, that is a very huge part to, I think, the success of our band mm-hmm. is that I've tried to really, first of all, we're a family. My band is four guys that are, are my chosen family. Mm-hmm. Um And I just have always treated them how I would want to be treated. And I work very hard for, I work hard for myself, but I also work hard for them. They're, they're important to me. Um, well, they, on, on they're a your very, family, like you on said. a very deep level, though. I mean, I've had three babies. Yeah. I've had they, it's been a kind of crazy run with me. And I would always say to them, "Don't give up! Don't give up on me! Don't get, you know what I mean? Like I'm coming back! I'm coming back!" And so I think. Interestingly, I'm going to go outside right now and tell you that this period of time with the pandemic has been annihilating to music, live music, okay? However, the average professional artist, there is a little part of us that are sitting home with our coffee and we're taking a zip and we're like, yeah, welcome to our world (laughs) of not knowing what is going to go on. Because what happens at where, what you get trained in Um, Hopefully you can always stay true to your craft and your music and your passion, but 
you also have to navigate the unknown constantly. I mean, Fireside Sessions, let's just take that, which is a, a series that ran at Bay Street for the last seven years. That was born from having my last child, Tallulah, seven years ago. She came in August. Um, unexpectedly, you know, at the height, uh, August is the mm -hmm. height of right there, our yeah. season. And I was sitting on my October. couch in November, yeah. first week of December, scratching my head going, what the hell am I going to do? When this is seven years ago, this is not 20 years ago. Yeah. And I talked to Inda, I talked to Telly. I, we were, I said, I, don't, I can't do an open mic. I'm too past that. I don't want to do that. I want to focus on. And so it took those conversations um, to create something that didn't exist. And, you know, calling up, cold calling Gary Higham and Tracy Mitchell and saying, give this a shot. They gave us four shows. They said, we look, the theater is black and we'll give you four shows. And I, can you f sell 90 seats? And seven years later, I think it is, uh, it's still going, hopefully, and we'll return. Yeah, I don't know what, what's going to happen this winter. I mean, we're still figuring it out. But I'm just saying the unknown is not kind but within the unknown is the freedom to create something magical. It feels like almost you've not prepared for this your entire life, but in a way you have been with different experiences. You kind of, I think it's interesting you can contrast the musical career and the pursuit of that with such a strange time. And there are a lot of parallels there. Well, you have to, I think you also have to, I mean, creating something from nothing um, takes a lot of different, parts of the brain, you have to quiet down the part that needs security and, and finance, <laughs> and you have to quiet down uh, people telling you no, which is another part of it. Yeah. And you have to kind of, um, I was given great advice many, many, many years ago. Um, I had the sincere fortune of uh, knowing Kelly Ripa for a period of time, and she she said to me, Nancy, put your blinders on. I was asking her this very random thing. And for some reason, that, that resonated with me. And, and she said, you're a horse. Put your blinders on and run your own race. And man, I'll be damned if that is not some of the best advice I was ever given. I think I had just had maybe leave on my middle child. And I was overwhelmed. My husband also had a band. There were things going on. And I couldn't keep up. And I just needed to put the blinders on. And, you know, just because you do that doesn't mean you're going to succeed. But you need to create. I think the one thing I really try to hold true right now is um, quality. I'm so over mediocrity. And, um, uh, you know, whether you like that or not. I'm sorry. I, I've done in my share of mediocrity in my life, of trying to get through, of of playing the countless, you know, keeping people dancing and all of that, which is lovely and part of my job as a musician. But now um, the pandemic's probably accelerated. It, it just seems clearer and clearer to me that the one thing you have as an artist is your craft and, and the purity of your craft. Well, so, And two, I think the power of focus, it sounds like, we're putting those blinders on and really and not allowing anyone and any comments to sidetrack you too and going for it. It sounds like you've really, over the years, it's interesting to see all these perspectives because I'd imagine it's so different now than when you first started the Nancy Atlas Project 25 years oh, ago. Oh, absolutely. How, what was it like when you started the band? How'd you meet those guys? Well, all at the open mic. And uh, actually, John Hanford was the first who is a, a guitar guy out here. And he started the first kind of uh, gathering, if you will. And I remember very specifically, we had our first show, and a bunch of people came down. And I, I think he handed me $15 at the end of the night, and I just thought, yeah, that's not going to work. <laughs> it's just not going to work. Sorry, ran a restaurant and counted the heads. I mean, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. You have to have – it's so boring. I don't know if it was Bowie or Jagger who said, though, that they spent their whole life kind of stepping away from it, and then they realized that they needed to be part of it to kind of give themselves I think there's a an fear, ease. and I've heard different artists talk about where they don't want to be – not corrupted by the business side, but they don't want to be sidetracked, and it's going to hurt their creativity. But at the same time, I think certain artists need both, especially when you're first starting out. Well, I think that if I'm really, really being honest, I would say that I would have loved for a manager to have come in. And I think if you dissect some of the biggest acts, they had that person, that pivotal person, pivotal person come in 
and guide them yeah. and, and let them focus on the art. And so I was never given that luxury, so I had to. I never had that person that came along and said, let me manage you. Let me take care of all of this. Mm. And you know what? I would have loved that. And I think probably there was um, a detriment to how far we got from not having that person. But because of the necessity of it, mm -hmm. I basically said, well, no one's there. We need to so do I'm this. So I'm going to have yeah. to do this. Yeah. And that's really been still true to this day, even with the hustle right now, you know? You've been doing a, so many different projects, and I, I just want to kind of trace it back because it's such a great cause. The Friday Night Hustle starts up in a few weeks on the 13th of uh, November, and we'll, get, we'll give all the details on that. But it's really, it's mainly to help the talk house and the employees and the people from the Stephen Talk House. Tell me a little bit about how, as you started with the band, when, when did you first play the talk house? How did you arrive there, so to speak? Well, I was I was playing open mics and and Peter and and Nick Krauss kind of pulled me aside and said you should have a show. Wow. And for a while I played acoustic and I actually did very well acoustic. So it was just I kind of had this Martin Sexton approach where I would just go up and play right. um, a guitar solo and sing. And I think that that is a great attribute. I know Annie Treza right now from Montauk is doing a similar thing where she just goes out. And I think that's what I really love about her. She's an up, up and coming singer songwriter is that you have to cut your teeth. You have to do that time and be that vulnerable. I know Inda did it for years too. So I think I did two years of that and I had, I had quite a following um, and then Peter said look I I'd love to give you a Friday night yeah. um, but I can't Friday nights are after the national acts I can't do it without a band and so we had this little thing with, with John Hanford and then um, I had met Johnny Blood at an open mic and Brett um, at the same open mic and then Neil Surreal had been uh, with a, one of my favorite bands which is Luke Grew my keyboard player um, and I was just a fan of them and I randomly asked if you would ever play and you know here we are 20 yeah. years later Matt Dow was the original drummer um, and then Richard came on I think about 20 years ago so it really is a long history with the talk house and it is such an important venue Oh, and, and a they place have out groomed here. us. They have groomed us. You know, they have. We have opened for. Oh, come on. We've opened for. We have played with Bon Jovi, Paul Simon, um, Johnny Winter, Dave Mason, Dick Dale, on and on. NRBQ, uh, De La Soul, Lucinda Williams. I had a whole relationship with Lucinda Williams for years. We were pen pals because of the Talk House, because I got to go up and meet her upstairs and give her a CD and say, if you don't want to listen to it, just use it as a beer coaster. <laughs> and, you know, six Six months later, I get a letter from her completely breaking apart my songs and telling me which lines and telling me to keep going and telling me that I wasn't an average songwriter, that I was that they, that I was great and that I had to keep. And, you know, those are things when you're a 26 year old waitressing at the corner bar that you need. And so um, I was going to ask you when you were going through that in the 90s and you're yeah. putting the band together. Who were you looking to? Because you had you had trained yourself on guitar. You had been writing, but it's kind of scary. I'd imagine when you're first starting out, you put those blinders on and you just go because that's what you want yeah. to do. But who who was helping you as far as writing? Your kind of your mentors. Well, I, I'm, I'm I'm definitely stubborn, um, and I think actually of all the things I learned in the art career that helped my writing and yeah. stuff like that, I would say art history because I had wow. studied the Renaissance and all of these um, Vasari and all of these people that had written on art. So at a very early age, I knew that art is opinion. And so my feeling has always been um, as long as I like it, uh, it's okay. I'm okay. But that also goes into the discussion of sucking you better know that you suck and when you suck i mean seriously no, you the, power think, no, no, the power of self-awareness power of sucking and this kid this is still advice that i give today um is that you know music in general 98 percent of the time people are going to come up to you after a show and say that was really great or that was nice or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. So and and for the people who's, you know, this hard. I'm sorry, I'm going all over the no, place. I but, love it. you know, the people that I like and that influence me, their intention as a musician 
is their craft and their songwriting. And it's almost like their song, their singers because of their writing. Mm. I'm not, I never plan on being a singer ever. Yeah. I was a writer. I wrote songs and then I was like, well, where am I going to get these songs to go? And so I became a singer to sing my songs. So my intention was my songwriting. There are musicians who the intention is attention. That's all they want. And some of them are famous and some of them, a lot of them, but I can see it. Yeah. Uh, I'm not allowed to swear, right? I'm not allowed to swear at all. Can yeah, I swear well, just a little? I think they can edit. Jason does an amazing job. No, it's job like, I can't do taxes. Uh, my, uh, you know, there's things that I really am not a, but the one thing that I know true music, professional musicians to have is a bullshit meter. Okay. I smell bullshit a mile away. And I think that's because I, I, I can read energy in a room. Mm -hmm. And so your intention as a musician better be pure and you better know when you suck because no one's going to tell you. Do you, you know what I'm saying? No, you don't want to, I hate to say this, from a, a layman's perspective, you don't want to be rude. And most of the time- No, you, most of the time people and, are going to go, oh, and you, hey, and you the watch, show is- And you hey. watch it, and, and you know what, it's funny because you hate that because you know when it's real. When praise is real, you know, and you know when it's not. I know my best nights. I yeah. know when I am off. I know when I haven't put my work in and gotten a Hail Mary and a critic, yeah. and, and I know when I haven't put my work in and I've I've failed miserably. And so I think that it's the artists um what's the word? The artists it's your commitment. It is your job as a professional, whatever you do, to 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 know when you saw, I mean, I'm not talking about self-loathing and no, I and what was me. I think that makes you better. That's what the blinders on. You you say, all right, this was a. I know what do I need to fix the next time when I well, go. Well, yeah, and and, and also on. if I'm, you know, there's a, a big circle between the musicians and the audience, okay, and I'm being guided by them and they're being guided by me, but really. Um, I think part of the success of our band has been that our intention, when we get on that stage, Johnny, Brett, mm. Rich, Neil, and I, is to bleed, uh, is to be vulnerable. I, people have said, oh, what do you think it is? I know exactly what it is. When I get on that stage, I am playing that show like it is the last show of my life, always. Always, whether you're seeing me at Gossman's or you're seeing me at a or at my father's place or packed out at the talk house or in front of 3,000 people at Martha Clara's Vineyard, I am going to throw down because I think uh, that life, as crazy and tortured as it can be and hard, is a gift. And if you're an artist and you can find that reprieve, um, that you have to honor it and so you know i that's what's exciting to me and i think that's what's exciting i think to the audience i think people get it and I, i'd like to if you can let's do a song um oh, here okay. on homegrown <laughs> but i think what resonates and i read a quote from a musician and i, I forget who exactly it was but it might have been chad smith that said something to other musicians she gets it or she she's one of us she'll represent us and, and i think what you just said there is what it's all about is that you understand um, what musicians, real musicians, are after, and I yes. think that's I think that's why you've really. I want to get into kind of how it's grown over the years with the fireside sessions, but also I don't want to. It's interesting. I read an article that talked about you playing at Levon Helm's barn, and I yeah. wanted to get into that. I'm just curious about the experience, but also you've almost created your own ramble in some level with all these different musicians coming. And I want to kind of get into that in a bit, but let's uh, let's do a song here on Homegrown okay. with Nancy Atlas here on LTV. Thank um, you for doing this This is a, a, a newer song. It hasn't been recorded yet. It's um, it's the first song I've ever I've ever written in three perspectives. So this is the female perspective. Um, I've also written it as a duet between a man and a woman, and then I've written it as a male perspective. Wow. Uh, but it took me quite a long time to write, um, and so it's called "The Bottle Is Your Bride." Very nice. Ooh, in black standing in the back head a foot against a wall hat down and smoking 
I was sitting on a stool waiting to play pool. I was checking you out, and you looked up in that moment. And I knew I'd never be the same. I loved the challenge, so it took your name when you sold it. But the bottle is your bride. And she ain't ever gonna let you go. But she makes you feel like a dead man walking. This beautiful world all alone Oh, now you don't run, you don't hide And that's a man that's by my side And I know it Oh, and I moan at the ceiling From the fire in the heart And the way that you finger the neck Of your guitar in the moment But baby, someday soon something's gotta change My flag is tired of your hurricane Always blowing Yes, the bottle is your bride And she ain't ever gonna let you go But she makes you feel like a dead man walking this beautiful world all alone She don't love you like I do She don't need you like I do And she'll move on to another one Darling, she won't feel a thing, babe After you're gone Yes, the bottle is your bride and she ain't ever gonna let you go But she makes you feel like a dead man Walking this beautiful world all alone Yes, the bottle is your bride But she ain't ever gonna let you go but I can make you feel like a new man walking I can make you feel like a new man walking This be Nancy Atlas here on Homegrown on LTV. As we get to know Nancy uh, a bit and kind of dive into how she's wound up here in Montauk and where we are now, we're in the mi middle of a pandemic, talking about <laughs> all a bunch of different projects. And I guess we, we talk about two families in a way. When did you meet your husband out here? When did I, I met my husband out here? Um, wow. It's not I a don't test. Know. He's I don't listening. Know. Going, I don't, no, I remember meeting him. Um, <laughs> You guys oh, I, oh, wait, I was at I was at Diamond Lills, uh, which was the Jag before wow. that. Which everybody that's old school that knows Caldors will know exactly <laughs> where I'm talking about. I think it sells wine now. Um, no, I remember meeting him, and I remember very distinctively that night. 
um, I had I was wearing pink with whatever, and he was all dressed like kind of like in black, and he had a black vest. Well, interestingly enough, and um, I thought I was acting really cool, and I went to walk into the courtyard, and there was a glass door there, and I oh, walked boy. right into. Oh. It's like one of those moments when you're like <laughs> looking for the straw, and you're like. You know, but oh. I, I I remember thinking, oh, great first impression. But then <laughs> Thomas and I would meet a uh, Sean Scanlon, who's from Sag Harbor, would have these black tie food um, drives, uh, these kind of food pantry drives for Christmas. Yeah. And we would always share a dance. One of them at LTV, believe it or not. Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. And so... Um, what was beautiful about that memory is that we would be, he would, you would dress, it was black tie. So it gave all of us out here something to great, great memories of that time. So girls would be dressed in gowns and then we would raise all this money. Sean, a chip to Scandy, to the Scandy man, that's, that's what I used to call him. <laughs> but uh, yeah. And so then over time, we both, um, we had both separated. He, he, he went and, had a girlfriend from Germany. I was with a guy out here, and then uh, we found our way back to each other. Yes. Wow. Did you um, did you plan on starting a family, and how did that affect touring and other things when you were kind of just getting into everything? Because I know. <laughs> how about those that... Dodgers? No. Because uh... <laughs> I know. Did that... having children affect touring? Because I'd imagine yes. it's changed everything, and it's kind of it almost has. a pre and post. But uh, but it's it's amazing to see you as a mother, and Thank it's you. interesting because. I've, I remember being, I saw a show in Montauk uh, a couple of years ago in the summer, and it, you talk about two families, but in a way it feels like one big one. Oh. And, and you have, you have your, your, your children, of course, and it's, it's different, obviously, band and the family, but at the same time, I, it's interesting to watch you interact with all of them and see how it all works together, because you really are um, such a leader, I guess, out oh, here on the East you. End. And, and it, it, I don't want to go because you know the, the the queen of the East End. I don't and know this about and that. that. I don't know about but, that. But but I, I find it interesting because and this brings us to the fireside sessions and working with all these different musicians is that that's the family feel. It feels like you want to build something, um, and it's nice to see that you have. It's interesting to see all the skills you develop over the years, whether it be business and, and booking tours and, and managers, and you kind of put that all together to help people. Well, um, I also think the average musician, yeah. everybody does that, not just me. I mean, I think that's why I have so much respect yeah. for all of my peers out here, okay? Because what most people don't see is that, mm -hmm. all right? Inda, myself, Gene, Winston, we're, we're, what ha by the time you see us on stage, that's the cream. It's not, okay, yeah, it's no you know, there's sure. no accident. Yeah. Okay, but, but I'm just saying, yeah. we're booking, we're doing all those things. Um, here's what I would say I have the vision to see it maybe and actualize it, um, and the connections that took over 25 years, the hustle. The Friday Night Hustle, which is starting November 13th, um, the tickets are at nancyatlas.com. <laughs> One of the hardest things during this period has been being somebody who is a professional. And I think I can really speak on behalf of almost all of the professional musicians. I'm talking about people who could have done many other things and chose to be a musician because it was their calling, okay? The Cliff Blacks, the all of them, um, has been the fact that not only can we not be together in a room and do what we do. But we've had to reinvent that, that, um, that dynamic and, f and f navigate through it, okay? So, so for me, the hustle was a way for us to give, all right, first of all, to give the community something. I do believe that we're gonna probably be heading towards in, into quarantine. This is something that we're, you know, we're heading back into. And so I was very depressed at the end of August and the beginning of September. Man. Most beautiful time of the year out here. Um, hated everyone and hated everything. That was a time typically when my hands are calloused. I'm a worker. I like to work. I, my, I, my entire life is based off of working in the sense that I relax better if I have finished a project. Okay, I finish the fireside sessions, I go on vacation. It's a classic. I'm probably could put me in a book, textbook person in that sense. I had September for the first time in my life since I'm 12, haven't worked through the summer. Wow. Now I'm heading into it and a light bulb went off in my head. I knew the talk house was in, in bad shape. I said, hold up a second. 
I know people here that can do this in their sleep. You put all of the, and they're phenomenal singer songwriters out here with bands that are phenomenal. We have to capture this before people start getting a, a cold and these things, because once you get the cold, it's five days of figuring out if you have COVID or whatever. So we took the window of the fall to record everyone at the talk house. So that now add the second layer of what do I know as somebody that suffers from depression? I, community is going to be what gets us through, Harry. Yeah. Okay? People really need to understand this because we're, going, we're figuring this all out in real time. You're going to have to look to community. You're going to have to look to shows just like this at LTV, to The Hustle, to your local papers. Express News Group was the first to come on board and support us, Gavin and Catherine. They were amazing. But, you know, I, I hope that people pick up that paper, that they pick up, and I hope they read it. Because those little things are going to make you feel normal and consistent. And having suffered depression and spent a lot of time where I now look at it as a friend, I can tell you this. Yeah. It is consistency in the beginning of your day that gets you through. Okay? So now the days are getting shorter. The, the, we're getting down to a lockdown period again, possibly. Um, we want everyone to be safe. What can I contribute to my community? I had to step over my, out of myself. I wish I was writing War and Peace and yeah. the best album you ever, but I was so depressed and so numb at the end of August that I just said, what can I do? And what I can do is gather the kindred spirits, keep them safe. And so, I mean, I'm telling you, I went into this with no money. I had no sponsors and I was just calling film people. I was calling um, Mike Baldessari, who like, he's one of the biggest light designers in the world. And I'm like, hey, buddy, are you out here? Could you just come down to the talk house and, and hook us up? And if I get a sponsorship, great. And he was like, sure, I'll come. And, and I'll tell you, it was so humbling and just what I needed to be reminded of. And I would say this on top of that, consistency, start your day with a, a paper. Get If you don't want to get a paper because you get a digital subscription to the Southampton Press or the Sag Harbor Express or the East Hampton Press or wh whatever floats your boat and take 10 minutes. It'll feel so much better than going to these national, you know, looking to CNN and getting overwhelmed by it all. Look to your community right now. Buy a freaking apple pie from a person that made it. Is it going to solve it all? No, but it's going to make you feel a little bit better. If you go to Bostwick's and you get a lobster pie or you go to Coche Commodore and you're helping out Mark Smith, who him and his family, uh, one of the most generous guys out here, or Colin Ambrose at Estia's Little Kitchen. I don't have to tell you if you live out here. You know who these people are. I think it's so important. Um, one of the... The positive side effects of all of this is you realize that uh, people really yearn for community. I think in the past you've kind of, not you, uh, but in general we've kind of gotten away from it. Everyone's on their phones and it's a, it's a huge, it's a small world. But we forget about our neighbors and it's kind of cool to watch over the past few months all the different community projects where people banded together in the beginning and they built face shields and then they, yeah, know, they right. it's nice to see. And then it's nice to be able to give back and, and buy local and support those local stores. So thank you for putting this, this whole thing together. You got it. But it's, I also think there's a, one part of this discussion. I just yeah, want to very sure. quickly, you know, there's always been this discussion for the forever out here yeah. with city and local and everything. Listen, we're in a pandemic right now and people are living out here and the people that have come out here are because they want to keep their kids safe or themselves safe and they have their second house, whatever. And that's, they have that right. And, 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 yeah. and there's no animosity on my front because I live in a tourist driven craft always. But here's the one thing I want to also say is, Community has been one of the biggest gifts in my life. We talked about right. things I could have done with kids. Well, if I had been on the road and whatever, I'd probably be longing for this life. <laughs> and so you have to be present to what you have. But if you have relocated out here and you are living out here, I encourage you to embrace your 
community. Become part of it. If you are fortunate enough to have a job that is um, left you, donate to your local food pantries. One up it. If you're healthy and strong, put on the shield, put on the gloves, get down there and volunteer. Buy the tickets to the hustle. Please become part of it. You know, people would say, oh, no, community. Yeah, I get it. But we're all we do have to have all in this. Grab a a paper, support the community and in doing so, become a part of it. And guess what? It's full circle and it gives back to the quality of your own life. But this animosity of who's here and who's not. I think the basic common thing is be nice. Oh, I do have one thing, though. If I wave and say good morning to you through, and it sounds like this, it is a good morning. <laughs> Just give me a wave back because when you walk straight forward and you and you're, I'm I'm like one step short of wanting to learn Taekwondo and uh, Kung but Fu. But it's funny you say that because when this started, you you're locked up for so long and you yeah. haven't seen different people. It's amazing when you go for a walk. You just want to say hi to everybody. That's walking. It's so past. true. And then and then you learn who is nice and who's not. Um, no, I'm going to start calling those, people for out. those morning walkers. It's going to be the COVID call out. <laughs> it's like good morning, and I'm going to start to say, was there something about good morning that you did not understand? It's it's such an it's such an interesting time too as we learn to be a community again. I think that's part of it too is that we are kind of figuring out all right we how do we do this again because I do think it kind of gets away from people. You get lost in your jobs. Well, recognizing yeah. where yeah. the community is, yeah. it's all around you. That's and as an artist, what I have learned and been humbled about by the hustle. Yeah. Now we're talking Gene Casey, Mama Lee, Winston Irie, Inda Eaton, Thomas Muse, Cliff Black, Bosco Michney, wow. uh, Kate. Usher and the Sturdy Souls, Sarah Conway for Christmas, Annie Treza, Andy Allador. I mean, we got as many people in as we possibly could. And I really focused on the original aspect. I made everyone play original music. Um, They were filmed and recorded at a top level. Five cameras, Pro Tools. So when you step into an hour every Friday of my community experience, it's going to be a celebration of art. And it's going to be a celebration of community and you'll hopefully feel better. But like it's all around you. You just have to look at it. And you also I have learned and been humbled by how amazing I felt just seeing everyone at a distance masked. Well, I think you brought up and I don't know if we discussed this or on the local earlier, but there's a you're doing a viewing party, too, in a way you're getting everyone together online to watch it. That's right. So that's uh, that's a good point is that if but that you have to watch on the day. Okay. Okay. So so if you buy this episode, there's six episodes running from November 13th to December 18th. Every Friday at eight o'clock, there'll be an hour episode. But as soon as you buy that link, you kind of own that link. I don't I. I don't know if it's a year, but it's like my point is this, that if you don't have time at 8 o'clock on November 13th, you can watch it at another time, which is I highly recommend, or you can watch it over. But if you want to be in real time with the community of it, it will be there will be a way that the musicians can correspond as we're all That's watching great. it together. On the th- every Friday at eight o'clock. No, that's true. So, what, what's the website? NancyAtlas.com. NancyAtlas.com has the direct links to get the. It's actually Musea at me, but if just to keep it easy, I just say just go to NancyAtlas.com and you're, you can get those links. You're always working on different projects, it seems, and this one <laughs> came out from the Fireside Sessions uh, years back. But in this one, I'm curious: Are you finding time to write uh, music just for for yourself or for the band? Well, interestingly enough, um, as much as this. The Friday Night Hustle 2020 has been for the community. Part of the thing that stimulated it is that I have not been writing. Okay. And um, I was, you know, most people say, oh, when you're dark. No, I don't mm. write when I'm depressed. I actually write when I'm happy. I can write you the saddest song in the world, but I have to be in a good, healthy state of mind. Um, so what happened for me at the end of August and beginning of September is I was like, man, I got to change my energy. And, and what can I do to do that? And like I said, I... Um, I just dove, you know, I, I started hiring people saying, I don't know how I'm going to pay you, but I will. Mm-hmm. And so that brings into also that if anybody does want to sponsor um, this series, we've gotten 27 East, Adam Miller Group, um, Stony Brook Southampton wow. Hospital came on board, but we still could use any additional money that the proceeds are going to go towards filming it, but also the musicians and the talk house staff, they can do so by going to the clam, uh, shell foundation.org 
slash shop. Okay. It's also at nancyatlas.com. But, you know, if somebody's feeling really moved by this conversation and wants to contribute to um, what is just, you know, a giant slice of community yeah. in very hard times, this is something we could definitely use the funds for. So It's interesting to see how people are um, choosing to, I don't say reinvent themselves during all of this, but um, finding a different lane to get through this. And, and it's nice to see because at first... Um, it's overwhelming, though, yeah, Harry. Yeah, you know, it's, it's incredibly difficult because you. I find seasons when they change. With them. You mentioned at the end of, of August, September, that seems to be the hardest because you realize how much time has gone by. Yes. And it's kind of figuring out, all right, what's what's next? Are there things that you're already thinking about after the hustle and, and kind of figuring out new ways to, to do all this? I know you launched a YouTube channel early That's on. That's a very interesting and, um, question. I did. And, you know, the Friday Night Hustle was actually born at the Talk House. I'll try to remember your question, but... That's okay. It was born at the Talk House in 2019. And then the pandemic hit, and I was supposed to have a show on March 21st at the Talk House. And I didn't know what to do. I canceled it. I was the yeah. first show to cancel at the Talk House in the beginning of March. I knew something was up. Um, Peter was pissed at first, but then he, you know, I think three days later canceled. Yeah, though. I mean. um, and so I loved the name the Friday Night Hustle. So I started doing every Friday night online and they are these derelict, probably career ending Well, I believe they're cooking in some of them. And they're, 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 they're on YouTube, but people yeah. will be very confused if they go to those YouTube. This is, that is not what we're doing now. The Friday Night Hustle 2020 is a different show that is not aired yet. Yes. So if you're going and looking online when this interview airs um, on November 8th, right? It's, yes. it's, it will not be shown yet. So if you're seeing mm-hmm. Friday Night Hustle, it's, it won't be. Uh, that's my derelict career ending live show which is raunchy and dirty and hysterical. And what you're seeing, I mean, I'm sweating bullets like I lose. I did not know what I was doing. But, well, that, but that's, the, and I think that led to this because everyone, I think it's taking that step. Absolutely, and, you and, must fail. And, and going and saying, oh okay, because it's hard. I think a lot of people, I mean, I hated webcams before all of this. And now you're like, all right, it's another Zoom call. Who cares? Right. And you get used to it as you go and you get to learn um, as you go, and it's kind of cool. I'm I'm excited, and even though you don't know necessarily what's after the hustle, I'm sure there will be another amazing project. I, that's, I haven't that's gonna really help the thought. Community. I am writing though yeah. now in the last eight weeks since I've done this. Wow! And so it's and, and on top of it, you know, I am focusing on all of my friends right now and trying to. Um, I will tell you that the Friday night hustle will be slamming. Um, it's all live. It's yeah. I mean it's caught. It's it's like canned peaches. You're, we've caught the talk house and the live music, original live music, in a time where it was safe. So it's not happening in that moment, yeah. but it's been, you know, created and edited and canned so that we can all come together and be safe. A lot of musicians are very vulnerable to COVID. I've mm-hmm. lost two friends uh, to it already. Seven total, but two musician friends, because we are, I do believe that the average professional musician is a conduit for energy. We, con- we are a conduit mm-hmm. for the energy of the room. And so you're, we're reading that room, we're channeling, and so, but our bodies take a toll for that. Run down, So Yeah, yeah. so I was very to- aware of that. Most of my guys are clocking in on 60 or over 60, and so I'm, you know, people are going, where are you, where are you? Well, I'm not really taking it lightly and just playing wherever I can because mm-hmm. I, it's not worth getting somebody sick in my band. But the answer to that is no, but I, I don't have a project after this, but I am in a different energy base. And, and that's just been simply reaching out to my friends and creating this thing. It's going to, this is going to take me through and I wake up and it's so funny. And I'm, I'm like so cranky. I, there's a joke that how do you get a musician um, to be cranky? And as so you give them a gig so, or what to complain about it, you know, you, and so I wake up and I'm like, I'm so busy, but I'm so happy to be busy. You know, no, it's a great project. NancyAtlas.com. And from this, uh, we're going to put all the links on the social I'm sure LTV. Oh, thank you. EHM. And we'll make sure that uh, people know 13th of November starts it. And it's a six week run and you own it too. You get to watch it anytime. Yeah. So if in January you're yeah. feeling blue, yeah. you can still buy it by the way all through the fall and winter so wait for, if you're if you're a doubting thomas and you want to wait just wait for some of the reviews i think people are going to be really 
No, it sounds amazing. Stoked. And it looks, just from the trailers and everything, the interviews, it looks terrific. Why don't we do one more song oh, uh, okay. here, here tonight and as we chat with Nancy Atlas. And I want to get into just a, one more thing we wrap up uh, as we are here on Homegrown with Nancy. Thank you for doing this. This is great. Thank you for having me. I know I was trying to get here earlier, but I was re- That's our you pleasure. Know, re- recording uh, everything at the talk house. Now you've time. got your hands full. I'm good. I'm good. I'm going to go for a... Uh, This song is off um, my. Uh, no, it's not my last album. My uh, album before that called "It Ain't That Way Now," which is a kind of a little bit of a theme song for 2020, I guess. I once was so restless, and each day was precious. Each moment of vow And you were My consummate dreamer My lover and my believer But it ain't that way now Oh, now anyone can love And anyone can try But I think I just might give up this fight I used to adore you like jewels on a crown But that's when I loved you, babe And it ain't that way now I used to be full of electricity It just came pouring out of me You could taste it in my mouth And you were the light Oh, that I'd run to each night Oh, how we burn so bright But it ain't that way now Anyone can love and anyone can try But I think I just might give up this fight I used to protect you I used to feel proud But that's when I loved you And it ain't that way now Oh, oh. Harry, this is where the solo goes So die, die, da da this fight I used to adore you like jewels on a crown I used to protect you I used to feel proud you'd rip me up and I'd work it out but that's when I loved you and it ain't that way now
Nice. Nancy Atlas here, LTV and Homegrown. As we get ready to uh, wrap up this episode, I feel like we could do a few more. Uh, but uh, thank you for doing this tonight. And I'm thank sorry, you. I don't even know what the hell I said. <laughs> I probably, I hope I answered at least one you, of your questions. You were terrific. Uh, thank you. But I think really, thank you for everything you're doing to push everything forward. It's not, like you said, it's not easy these times. And I think there are people that it's a, it's a very difficult time. And with this project, who's in the first episode, in the first stream? The first episode's uh, Cliff Black. Gene Casey, Mama Lee, wow. Inda Eaton, myself. Um, I'm, I'm st- honestly, you know, we're in the final touches of it. Oh, and Danny Keene, who's just phenomenal. Uh, you know, the thing is, you're going to see people pop up again through other episodes. I had everybody record three songs for the most part. Excuse me. And then, um, so every week's going to be this, but that's to keep you stimulated. But truly, I just want everybody to know um, this is a little bit of a love letter to the talk house. It's a love letter to my friends, yeah. and it's a love letter to the community. Um, I think we are going to be in tough times. I think a lot of us are in tough times right now already. And I just want you to know that this entire project, the intention that has led it circling back to that, has been love. Um and so I, I hope that if you are, are just feeling sad that you give it a shot, be open to it, please. We could use your support. And if you're struggling and in a very, very tough time, please go to the, webs, uh, the, talk, the talk House website and look for contact there and send them an, uh, an email. Um, you know, $10 an episode, at, and it's a sliding scale. But uh, it really is a love letter. It's a little bit of my love, of love letter to uh, everyone and I would like to say thank you to Peter Honerkamp, to Nick Krause, to Gavin and Catherine at 27 East, to Adam Miller at the Adam Miller Group, to Barbara Joe at Southampton Hospital, Stony Brook Southampton Hospital. For um, They were the initial sponsors that jumped on and for supporting it. And, and for, to you, Harry, for getting the word out there. Because it will take uh, a community to um, keep not only a calm mind, but some love in the mix too. And buy an apple pie from Boswick's Catering. <laughs> well, thank you very much for this. We, I appreciate chatting with you and learning about this. And we can't wait to see all, all six episodes. I, I well, It's I, needed. So thank you. You got it. We, thank we you. We appreciate it. Wrapping up tonight. Thanks to Nancy Atlas. All the details, I'm sure it'll be linked up in, on LTV's YouTube and all of that. will have everything you need. Also at WEHM as well. And uh, we'll, we'll get all the info you need. Follow them on Facebook as well and social for all this. For yeah, the, Instagram the the hostel. for me is a good one, Nancy yeah. Atlas on Instagram. People can really follow along. Very good. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. We can't wait to see it. The six weeks are going to be amazing, and we can't wait to see it. Thank you so much. Wrapping up tonight's Homegrown. Thanks for watching, and Nancy, thanks again for coming in. We really appreciate it. You got have, it. Have a great night.